It, it is always an honor and a privilege to, to be here at, at Bayside Church. Love this church, just beautiful inside and out. You're aesthetically very pleasing people as well. And um, I love what God is doing here and, uh, and how he's still got so much good in store uh, for the life of this church and uh, so much life to bring through this church. Uh, just as I was just worshiping God in song with, with all of you, uh, I was just uh, really just resting and, and waiting upon the Holy Spirit regarding exactly, precisely uh, where to head this evening. And, and as Pastor Rob was just talking about the series that you guys will be starting next week, um, something just stirred in my heart, and um, I really felt that it was appropriate for me to jump on board with this series about uh, growing up and being a part of God's team. I, I felt like it was appropriate. There was a, an SAS commando and, and high-performance athletes who are going to be a part of this series. You've got like kind of nationally ranked distance runners. You've got Melbourne victory players. And, and I was the captain of the under-15A uh, table tennis team at Haleybury <laughs> College. And so I really felt it was, really felt it was fitting for me to somehow play a part, <laughs> jump, jump in, if you will, on this series about becoming a part of God's team, growing and succeeding here in God's team. In all seriousness, that stirred in my heart because this whole life deal is a team sport. Yeah. This whole life deal is a team sport. Yes. For you to survive in life, for you to get from point A through to point B, for you to taste and experience your destiny. The team is required because life is a team sport. For you to not only survive, but to thrive. For you to go forward and to do all the things you've been called to do, to achieve all the things the God of this universe desires you to achieve, to taste the sweet nectar of joy that he wants to pour into your cup. The team is required because life is a team sport. You can't do this deal alone. God made this abundantly clear. He got like two chapters into writing this book and he, and he made a comment that has echoed and reverberated all through time and it rings ever true today. God created the heavens and the earth. He set stars into space. He separated night and day. He was reflecting upon creation and he saw humanity. He saw this Adam that he made and he was blown away by this Adam made in his image. We were precious and unique and important right from the beginning. But he would make a reflection in Genesis chapter 2. I love this Adam that I've made, but there is something missing. There's nothing wrong with him. I can't make a mistake, but this picture is incomplete. You know what? It's not good for man to be alone. I must make him someone to do life with. And right there, God sets into motion a pattern that has never, ever changed. Life is a team sport. I need you. You need me. We need each other to survive. That's the reason the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 would make this reflection when he's thinking about life. Most people believe it was Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man besides Jesus to ever walk the face of this earth. And as he was reflecting about life near the end of his life, he would think about that which was most important. And it's amazing how he would put into context and into place finance and possessions and wealth and, and, and prominence and success and, and how he would propose that all of those things are really eclipsed by how important relationships are. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he coins this phrase that two are always better than one. You've got to understand that that scripture wasn't penned for the sake of wedding ceremonies. No, this was a reflection about life and how we were made. Life is done best when we do it genuinely together because life is a team sport. That's the reason in Psalm chapter 68, the psalmist is reflecting about life as well. And he talks about God's heart and God's desire to find us individually, some of us isolated, some of us alone, and to pick us up out of that isolation hole and to set us in a family. This is God's purpose. This is God's plan. This is God's pleasure. Life was meant to be a team sport. 
And God wants us to do it connected and together. You don't even have to be a Christian to intuitively know this. You don't even have to be a Jesus follower or a Bible believer to instinctively get this. There is something inside each and every single one of us that knows that life is a team sport, that we were meant to do this deal together. That's the reason as you reflect upon movies and, and TV and, uh, and books and, and every stream of media, the, the, the stories that really grip our hearts and captivate our imaginations are always about relationships and connections because this is intuitive. We were, in a sense, created for this, to know and to be known. Life is indeed a team sport. That's the reason most of you here in this room are addicted to social media. You can't handle the thought of being outside of that communal loop. We can be threatened with fines of $400 plus and the loss of six demerit points if we check our mobile phones while we're driving, but you still do it. Why? Because we can't handle the thought of missing out on that message that text message, come on, we can't handle the thought of driving 15 minutes and missing out on that picture of what your friend had for breakfast on Instagram. We can't handle the thought of going 15 minutes from point A through to point B and not knowing if someone has tweeted about me or mentioned me. We can't handle the thought because it is instinctive, it is intuitive. This is, in a sense, that which is most human about us that we know that we were created to connect because life is a team sport. Even the Lone Ranger knew he needed Tonto. <laughs> life is a team sport. So you to, for you to like survive in this deal called life, we need each other. And I would go even further and propose to you that if we we desire to not only just survive in life, but to thrive in life and to go forward into every good thing that God has for us, we need to process through this question, what does it really mean to succeed in God's team? Because life is a team sport. In many ways, my capacity to live out God's plan for my life is intrinsically linked to the manner in which I relate to you and the way that you relate to me and the way that we relate to each other, for us to live a successful and God-honoring life, we need to process through what it means to truly connect because life is a team sport. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about how we're really one big body with many parts, and every single part needs each other. The eye can't say to the ear, you're not required. The hand can't say to the foot, you're ugly, hide away. Every member of the body is required for us to function healthily and effectively. We need each other to do what God would desire us to do. That's the reason in John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus makes it abundantly clear. A new command I give to you, love each other. As I have loved you, so you must love each other. It's by this everyone would know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Are you catching what Jesus is flinging here? Are you smelling what he's cooking? He's making some very definitive statements. He's going, a new commandment I give to you. Up to this point, the stuff that I've said, cool. If you want to discuss it or debate it, that's fine. But now I'm drawing a line and setting something in concrete I'm etching something in stone. A new command I give to you. Code four, if you weren't paying attention up to this point, switch on now. Love each other. As I have loved you, so you must love each other. It's by this everyone would know that you're my disciples. Or in other words, this was meant to be our distinctive as his people. Beyond the sermons we preach and the songs that we write and the programs we run and the conferences we put on, this was meant to boom louder and clearer than anything else about us. The way we interrelated, the way we genuinely connect, the way we understand that life is a team sport and we live this life like one within a team. 
Relationships are so central. This team concept is so key. In a sense, everything hangs on this. So what I want to do for my last few minutes with you here this evening, and I'm not joking about the last few minutes, as is my custom, I came here tonight before eating dinner, and I'm a little bit peckish. And so I've only got to probably go about 10, 15 minutes more. I want to maybe just drill down just a little bit deeper about this concept about what it means to be a part of and to succeed within God's team. I want to explore maybe just a few ideas about how we can connect in deeper degrees and in wider dimensions. And as an extension of that, not only survive here in life, but to, come on, thrive in life. I want to process through this question because I believe that when we allow the Spirit of God and His Scriptures to guide us in our relationships, our relationships with our spouses, our husbands, our wives, our relationships with our mums and our dads, our children, our relationships with our friends and our work colleagues, our, our, our relationships with our, with our neighbors and those who live around us, when we truly and genuinely grow in these kinds of relationships, Everything about life just takes on a different hue. And in so many ways, we honor God so much more. And we stride forward so much greater into this life that he has destined and designed for each of us. The way I want to explore this concept of what it means to truly grow up and succeed being a part of God's team is I want to have a look at... Um, a verse in the scriptures where the writer is writing to the people of God and talking to them about succeeding in God's team, about living a life connected, growing in relationships, understanding that this whole life deal is a team sport. And what I want to do is just read this scripture and just make a few observations. And as I make these observations, I want to shape them as challenges, and I'm not throwing them at you, I throw them at myself as well. Because I want to, come on, grow in connection. I want to grow better in relationship. I want to understand deeper and deeper that this is a team deal. Because I want to honor God more and more. I want to shine his light brighter and brighter. I want to stride every single day, every single season, come on, every single year into more, the more that he has in store for me and the stuff that he wants to do through my life. Is that cool? So here we go. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 24. If you've got your Bibles, would you go with me to the book of Hebrews? The book of Hebrews. There are four people excited about their Bibles. <laughs> I love Hebrews. Since I am in the church of the famous, and I would say in some circles, the infamous Pastor Rob and Christy Buckingham, but Pastor Rob, the king of puns, the king of puns. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust out my one of my favorite dad puns right now. This is one that I wrote myself. This is coming from the book of Hebrews. No one really knows who the writer of Hebrews was. Uh, my senior minister, Nicole Connor, actually thinks that it could be a woman who wrote it, but I don't believe that it would have been a woman because if it was a woman, it would be called Shebrews. See how, ah, that's awesome. You should have laughed more than that because you should be used to this kind of stuff. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. I made that, I wrote that myself. You can ask TM. So <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. I love the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 10 in particular is a beautiful book. To give you the context here, in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer who was writing to a community of Jesus followers in a broken world um, was, was trying to unpackage and reiterate this glorious gospel in which they have been uh, caught up uh, in and now they are protected by. If you're not a Christ follower here in this room and you're trying to ask a few questions about Jesus and God and this gospel, which means the good news, this whole kind of Jesus message, message stuff, Hebrews chapter 10 is actually a really good chapter to read. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about how God is love and humanity is broken. And since the beginning of time, humanity has been trying to climb their way back to God, but there was always this chasm that could not be bridged. But God in his goodness came to us and embraced us with his love, and bridge that gap through his son, Jesus. And now the writer goes on in Hebrews chapter 10 
trying to unpackage this idea of now living out this good news. How do we now live out this truth in our everyday lives? And his first port of call was this concept of living out our lives in the context of a team with each other in relationship as an extension of a community. And he talks about this in in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25. This is how we deepen in our relationships. This is how we grow in friendship. This is how we go forward as a team. And he challenges the, the people Uh, addressed in the book of Hebrews, and he challenges us here today. He says this, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. And do it all the more as you see the day approaching. So this life deal is a team sport. How do I grow as a part of this team? How do I deepen and richen my relationships with the people around me? The writer of Hebrews says, well, consider how you may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Don't give up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and do this all the more as you see the day approaching. Just a few thoughts, just a few ideas, and then I'm going to quench my thirst and satisfy my peckish hunger somewhere at a local eatery here in the Bay Area because the food is just lovely out this direction. All right, here we go. If you're taking down notes, here's a good time to pull out your notebooks and your pens. If you have an iPhone or an iPad or an Apple-based device, pull that out. You're awesome because, because how good is Steve Jobs? If you have like an Android or a Blackboard, put that away. I've got nothing for you from this point on. <laughs> Just a few little thoughts about how we can all grow in relationship. Come on, how we can all deepen our connection and how we can all maybe take that next step in succeeding as a part of God's team because life is a team sport. Point number one, if we're really going to grow in our relationships, if we're really going to go forward as a team, it will require our consideration. Point number one, write this down, consider. Everyone say consider. Come on, say consider. Say consider like an Australian. Consider. Say consider like an American. Consider. Say consider like a Chinese man. Consider. Awesome, I taught you a language. You can laugh. That's kind of racist. You laughed a little bit stronger than... That's kind of not really appropriate. That's messed up. If we're really going to grow in our relationships, husbands, wives, with our mums, our dads, our children, those around us, our work colleagues, our friends from university, if we're really going to grow in these relationships that God has ordained us to live within and God has designed us to thrive from, we need to first and foremost in this day and age consider. This requires a deliberate effort. Growing in relationships will take some mental effort. I I like this concept. Here the the writer of Hebrews is challenging us not to just take this for granted or, or hope that it will happen naturally. This will require our consideration. But wait a second, Dan. Didn't you just say a few minutes ago that we all desire relationship, that we were made for connection, that this is a team sport? Didn't you just say this is intuitive and instinctive? Yes, I stand by that. But I propose to you that we live in a world that is not centered on us connecting. We live actually in a world full of currents and rips and tides marked by individualism which would drag us away from one another. And if we're just hoping that the course of time will draw us closer together, we'll be hoping and waiting a very long time because, like I said, we live in a culture. We are existing in a society, come on, with currents and rips and tides that are dragging us away from each other and making us want to focus more and more in on ourselves. Have you ever been caught in a current or a rip or a tide? I haven't because I'm scared of the water because I'm Asian. But, but I've heard. <laughs> Have you ever watched Bondi Rescue before? I don't know why an Asian brother would ever, ever go near the beach after watching Bondi Rescue. It shouldn't be called Bondi Rescue. It should be called dragging random Asian people out of the surf because that's what I have every single week. 
Some Korean brother shows up. First thing he does, goes to like a souvenir shop, buys like a pair of board shorts with like an Australian flag on it, jumps into Bondi, gets caught in a rip, doesn't mean it, gets sucked out into the open ocean. Hoppo's got to go out there, drag the brother in there. Every single, I'm scared of the ocean in general, but I've heard that there is such a thing as a current and a rip and a tide. And if you get caught in it, you don't even notice it, but you can end up somewhere you didn't desire. And this is the world we live in. We live in a world so focused in on itself. The most important person in the world is you. In 1976, about 10% of houses were single dwellings. One in 10 houses had somebody in it living by themselves. Fast forward a bunch of years to this day, it's just sort of 30% now. Or in other words, three out of 10 houses just has somebody by themselves living in it. Australians are growing more and more accustomed to just doing life alone. We, we live in a world always trying to let you know you don't need anyone else. If you, you don't even have to go to a workplace. You, you can lock yourself in this room and, and log into this. Uh, I, I don't know much about technology, but you can, you can, you can from, a, um, from a distance, connect with others and not really ever truly deeply connect. It's about iPhones and iPads and MySpace and this face on that book. And it, it, <laughs> so much about this world is consistently, continually trying to convince you that, hey, you can do this by yourself. So if we're going to really succeed in God's team, we have to, number one, come on, put our thinking caps on, come with some effort and some energy, and understand this will require our thoughtful consideration. Point number two, really quickly. Not only do we need to consider, we also have to understand we need to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. I like that phrase, spur each other on. That word spur is an interesting one. Uh, From memory, I think that word spur in the Greek literally means to provoke each other, to annoy each other, to prick each other. I I like that concept. I like this thought that growing in relationship and deepening community isn't just about being in the same room with each other, but recognizing we're all in a team together, come on, and we're heading somewhere together, and it's our responsibility, come on, it is your responsibility to cheer the person to your left and to your right on. Proximity alone will not deepen relationship. So some of the husbands here in the room come, ah, oh, Really? Can't I just hang around in the room, and isn't that just enough? Uh, one of, one of, my senior uh, pastor, Mark Connor, is, is very similar in the dad joke kind of. Uh, you're, you're like, you're, you know, you're a master. You're like kind of, you, you're next level, and then where, whatever level that is, you took another step from there somehow, and that's the echelon in which you like basically reside. But my senior pastor, he loves telling the, the, the dad kind of jokes all the time. And he always tells a story about the, um, the woman who says to his, uh, her husband, like, goes, why don't you ever tell me that you love me? And then the husband says to the wife, well, I told you on my wedding day, if anything changes, I'll let you know. And so, uh, <laughs> can't relationships just grow? Can't I just deepen in my friendships? Can't I just become a deeper part of this team it, it, just by being around? No, this requires us, come on, to spur one another on. It requires us to take other people's success and victory into our interest. It requires us to maybe step into an uncomfortable place and be vocal about how excited we are about them going forward and becoming a part of what God is genuinely doing in the earth. I I love this challenge here because it flies in the face of what so much of this world would dish up. Hey, you know what? You know, just being around, that's enough. And If you hang around with people, you'll grow in relationship. Here, the writer would say, no. Growing as a part of God's team requires our capacity to see the bigger picture. It requires us to be vision-driven and purpose-filled and us to make a decision, a deliberate decision, to cheer each other on towards love and good deeds. I love this idea of spurring each other on. I always like this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Third point here, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Write this one up, don't give up. Don't give up. If we're going to grow in relationship, if we're going to go forward as a team, 
We can't give up. It's easier to give up on each other in this day and age. You live in a culture which says this, if you, you know, if you get offended, that, that, you know, you just kind of just, you know, you turn your back on and you just walk away. You've got to protect. Don't give up. Can I just let you know, it's not going to take long until someone annoys you. It's not going to take long until someone offends you. I hear it so often at church, you know, people go, oh my goodness, I'm just so sick of Christians. I'm so sick of like this whole church deal. Like people are just so judgmental, which I kind of find funny because by saying that, you're judging people about, but that's another talk for another day. And that person goes on and says, well, they're so hypocritical as well, which is kind of true because you were judging someone for being judgmental and you didn't even know it yourself, which makes you a hypocrite. So yes, the church is full of hypocrites as well. The reality of the church being full of judgmental hypocrites, that is nothing new and nothing is going to change. We are all broken but by the grace of God. What makes us a team is that we don't give up. But he said that, no, don't give up. She did, don't give up. I love how the Apostle Paul breaks this concept down a little bit in the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, when he says, hey, you know what? Don't give up on each other. In fact, bear with one another. Hang on to each other. Forgive each other, just as Jesus forgave you. I like that, because the Apostle Paul is just being really upfront. Or in other words, he goes, you, you're going to annoy each other, all right? Team, you're going to annoy each other. And I know this for a fact, because I'm annoying. And, and, and don't laugh, because you're annoying too. And, uh, <laughs> but this is what makes us a team. We're going to bear with each other. We're going to hold on to each other. Oh, we're going to fight, but we're going to learn how to forgive. We're going to disagree, but we will search until we find common ground. Bear with each other. And the Apostle Paul gives us, a, gives us a heads up on how we're going to do this. We have to learn how to forgive each other. Come on, we have to learn how to let each other off the hook. Or in other words, if you want to not give up and bear with each other, at some point you're going to have to learn the discipline of forgiveness. We let each other off the hook. And he even tells you this. This is how you let each other off the hook. He says, forgive just like Jesus forgave you. Or in other words, you just reflect upon how much Jesus let you off the hook. It's pretty hard to hold a grudge against somebody else. Because for every, every one dumb thing done against you, you've done 10 dumb things that no one has seen, but Jesus lets you off. The only person here in this room who is exempt, exempt from the discipline of forgiveness is the one who has never done anything that requires the forgiveness from Jesus. Anyone here tonight? My hand isn't raised. Forgive one another. Come on, let them off the hook. There's an old Chinese proverb. Aren't Chinese as great at proverbs? Fried rice and proverbs. Oh, we're good at that stuff. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. This came into my head. <laughs> they said, before embarking on a journey of revenge, make sure first you dig two graves. Or in other words, if you want to hold bitterness or offense in your heart and you think you're going to get back at someone by holding that until you get your revenge, you may take them out, but your life and your soul will be taken out as well. Dig two graves. I like to believe that the transverse is true as well. In fact, the Bible would present this. That as you embark on a journey of forgiveness, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, that friend you haven't seen for years, as you embark on that journey of forgiveness, be prepared to experience two pardons. The pardon for that faulted, failed fool who let you down once upon a time, but also your pardon as well as you are released into freedom and liberty. The freedom and liberty that you could never, ever experience as one who has not learned how to forgive. If we're going to not give up, come on, on each other, we're going to have to at some point learn the discipline of forgiveness. Okay, quickly, keep going. My, hum, my stomach's starting to rumble. All right, so let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Come on, consider. Cheer each other on. Don't give up on each other. Let us encourage one another. Okay, write that one down. Encourage one another. Come on, encourage. Encourage literally means to give courage to another. There is something inside of me that if I would release it to you, it would bring life into your world. How cool a thought that we have the power and the capacity to bring life to each other. That's the reason in the book of Proverbs, it talks about how in our tongue, in our mouth, in our words, we have the power of life and death. 
We have the ability to ruin someone with our words, but at the same time, we have the power to resurrect as well. And here the writer of Hebrews is challenging us to not only consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, he's only challenging us not to give up on each other, but to bear with each other and forgive each other, but to also encourage, come on, and give life to each other. I love that thought. The Apostle Paul would go even further. He would say in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, So therefore, don't let anything come out of your mouth that doesn't build others up. Let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth, only that which is encouraging and useful for other people around you. No one has ever been encouraged to death. But many a soul has suffocated from lack of it. Encourage one another. Come on. Encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Has anyone ever experienced the joy of oxygen before? <laughs> Has anyone ever had received oxygen through a pump before? I, I've had it once. I, I passed out during the birth of my second child. <laughs> Don't judge. You weren't there. Until you walk a mile in my awesome shoes, don't judge. It was a long night. My, my wife had been laboring the whole way through the night. I, I, I get it. She was exhausted and she was tired. I get it, okay? But I was physically and emotionally exhausted too. <laughs> my son finally came out, and um, the labor was so traumatic. He, he came out and he wasn't breathing, and I started freaking out. My heart started racing, the nurse started yelling, and she was telling me to hit the emergency button. I got up too quickly, and everything went dizzy, and then I went black. And then the next thing I know, I'm sitting on a chair, sucking on oxygen, looking at my wife doing this. <laughs> but man, I, t I love that oxygen. We need to, as a team, learn how to give each other oxygen. You live in a world where oxygen of the soul is sometimes so rare. Don't get me wrong, encouraging each other is sometimes awkward, but it's always awesome. Some of us here in this room haven't heard encouragement for a long time. Hey, someone else in this room has been called to be the solution to that issue this year. There are some people here in this room who so often want to release a life-giving word to somebody else, but they're afraid this is the year where you're going to start releasing it. And as a team, we're going to breathe. Come on, and as a team, we're going to run forward with, with vigor and with energy. Encourage one another. I try to do it with my wife as much as I can. It's not hard because you're hot, but like in general, like just <laughs> husbands in this room, encourage. Encourage your pastors, encourage your leaders. Try to find the most minute, minuscule, easily overlooked matters, but encourage like there is no tomorrow. Encourage one another. When it comes to encouragement, I never want to be accused of being a miser. In that area, I want to be licentious. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Don't give up meeting together. Some get into the habit of doing that. But encourage each other and do it all the more as you see the day approaching. As the gospel keyboard ninja girl or guy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see... They usually send up a girl because I don't tease the girl. But you guys are braver than the average church. You just send a dude up there. So I'm going to sit on that. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to dare you. I'm going to double dog dare you. Don't do 2014 alone. Don't allow the disconnect to grow. Turn that tide and recognize life is a team sport it will require our consideration it will require us 
to cheer other people on. It will take us not giving up on each other, but bearing with each other and forgiving each other, and it will take some encouragement. But if we do that, we might just win this. Life is a team sport. I read a book a couple of years ago by, um, have you read Into the Wild before? Will, yeah, Chris McCandless. Really interesting um, story about a young man fed up with kind of life and what the Western world was effectively dishing up as happiness. So he sold everything, gave it all away, started to just travel, ended up in forests, ended up in the wilderness. And his journal is quite amazing. Some of the interactions with creation, the sunsets and the sunrises. He, in so many ways, kind of graduated into what was meant to be happiness, free from the things of this world, free to enjoy what God had created. Unfortunately, McCandless only lasted a couple of years. He died of food poisoning, and with his body, he f they found his diary from which they wrote the book. And was, what was really interesting, what was, what was in his diary, he just talked about how he saw these amazing things, had these incredible experiences, just, just, just flew by the seat of his pants. His life was really an adventure, but the only times he ever truly experienced joy, fulfillment of ha or happiness was when he crossed paths with other people. And then he coined this phrase, happiness is only real if it's shared. That's beautiful. It's beautiful because it's biblical. God wants you to live a full life. God wants you to experience His best because He has got your best at His heart. But to do it, come on, we need each other. Life is a team sport. Lord Jesus, I love you and I thank you so much for this opportunity to hang out with my friends out here in the Bay Area. And I pray especially, Lord Jesus, for those here in this room who are living and going through strained relationships. Right now, I speak healing and wholeness over that relationship. I pray, Lord God, for forgiveness to flow, for a good word, Lord Jesus, to resurrect. I pray, Lord God, you would grant men and women here in this room boldness and courage to turn some situations around in 2014. I thank you so much that you desire to do this and you will do this for your name's sake. I thank you so much, God, that you called us by name, picked us out of the crowd and set us in this family. And I thank you that by your grace and for your glory, we will see our victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Look, my time is done. The band has moved. The keyboard is going. That's kind of, that's church talk for, hey, your minutes are up. <laughs> but I'm going to be hanging around a little bit at the end of this meeting. And if you're someone here this evening who hasn't got a relationship with the most important person in this universe, and that is Jesus Christ, or you want to talk more about that, I would love to have a chat with you. Jesus considered you worthy of giving his all. He wants to spur us on towards love and good deeds. He has never given up on us. And here is, he is the greatest encourager. His name is encourager. So my heart's hope and my heart's prayer is this, that you wouldn't leave this place without talking to me or someone else about a relationship with the one who was most important to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You guys are amazing. You guys are wonderful. God bless your team. We hope you enjoyed watching this video and plan on returning to the Bayside website soon. If you're in the Melbourne area, why not visit us at either our Cheltenham or Frankston location and discover how church has changed. Check it out.